Hola, Bien. Hola, hola. Bueno, eh, buenas tardes hola, a, a todos. Hola, hola. Voy a tener el honor de presentar a Marius van Eisendor en esta videoconferencia. Espero que resulte eh, interesante y técnicamente también pueda ser fluida. ¿ya? Bueno, Marius van Eisendor, quizás muchos de ustedes a, lo conocen eh, a través de la literatura, es uno de los eh, científicos en el área de la teoría del apego más productivos. Eh, por supuesto, es el que está en, al medio de la foto. ¿Ya? Eh, a la derecha está Andrés Fresno, que es de la Universidad de Talca, también trabaja en apego, y a la izquierda un colega de Magallanes. Eh, Marinus van Eisendor es profesor of Human Development en el Departamento de Psicología de Estudios de Educación e Infancia en Erasmus eh, Rotterdam. Eh, también es eh, Welcome Trust Visiting Professor en Primary Care Unit School of Clinical Medicine, University of Cambridge, UK. Era más fácil así que traducir, no sé. Eh, también es emeritus profesor of Child and Family Studies en Leiden University, donde eh, desarrolló gran parte de su carrera, o digamos toda su carrera. Si uno quisiera hacer una, visualmente, eh, tratar de entender cuál es el impacto científico de Marinus en la teoría del apego, uno podría ver esa lámina que está basada en un cálculo acerca del número de citas del handbook de uh, attachment, el handbook de apego, de, este es el anterior, sí, del 1998 creo que es, eh, donde se reflejan digamos, lo, lo, los apellidos de los autores y su eh, importancia en el impacto que, que han tenido a través de las citas de ese handbook. Eh, pertenece eh, al 1% de los científicos más citados en el mundo. Ya hay una lista que la pueden eh, ver en esa eh, herramienta, donde uno puede encontrar quiénes son los científicos más eh, de más alto impacto o más citados. Él está eh, dentro de ese de selecto grupo. Eh, y su nivel de, de, de impacto, de, de citas, eh, su factor de impacto también es bastante alto, es bastante impresionante su trabajo. Eh, además de eso, también es muy buen tenista. Eh, nunca le pude ganar un partido de tenis. I just say that you are a very good tennis player. Uh, you won all the matches. Pero también es porque yo me dejaba perder, porque cómo le iba a ganar al supervisor. But it's also because you were my supervisor, so I cannot win a match against you. Yeah, you're right. Entonces... Um, Ahora, bueno, entonces es, esa es una breve presentación del de profesor Marinus Van Eisendor. Eh, ¿Puedes compartir esa? Sí. Ok. Ok, now people is seeing you and you can start with uh, some words and then the presentation. Thank you. Uh, ok. Thank you so much for your kind uh, words, uh, Rodrigo. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, to this Congress, the fifth Congress of uh, the Iberian American Attachment Network. There's a lot of attachment research going on in South America, and uh, I think one of the reasons for that is that it's this Congress, uh, already for the fifth time, bring people together from all over the continent and. Uh, creating colonial importance for moving the field forward. So, very happy to support this, um, this, uh, this um, initiative. And I hope to talk a bit about uh, our research on parenting, uh, biology of parenting and attachment, and whether there's uh, sufficient room for interventions. Um, this is the first time in my whole career of four decades that I'm presenting a talk uh, through Skype or some kind of connection. Never did it. Um, I hope it's going to be, uh, work out well, but uh, I'm apologizing in advance for any uh, problems that would arise um, during the talk. Uh, I have several different uh, video clips and I hope that they make it through to Uruguay, which is uh, about uh, 20 hours from here, four hours 
earlier in the day. It's here evening already. And I hope to uh, um, talk to you at the speed uh, that you let me know whether it's going too fast or too slow, and whether there's any inconveniences. Uh, but I, I would like to try now to start and see how the PowerPoint is working. think it's working now, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's, it's not working because we can see thousands of screens as soon as you share. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, let me see if I can... Is there anything No, I'm sorry, no. Maybe if you share your screen and then minimize that one, we will see your PowerPoint. Share the screen at the bottom. Um. I don't know how I get it back. Uh, uh, this is just. Uh, Oh, goodness. Uh, so if you try again the same procedure, but when you see all the screens um, going on, you can just minimize that one, and I think we will see then the PowerPoint at the background of your computer. But yeah, but I, I don't see anything now on the screen at all. Um, at the top to the right. Okay, okay. Yeah, now, now I have some. Uh, so I share the screen. Yeah. And okay. minimize that one, the Google Hangout. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Okay, no, I'm I don't know how to do that. Uh, the right side on the top, minimize this screen. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Uh, no, no, stop. Exit full screen. Yeah, maybe. And then, uh, yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Go on. I'm, I'm sorry. Visible now? Can we uh, start? Yeah, sure. Okay. 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 So, thank you. I'm, I'm going to start um, lower biology of parenting and attachments, so room for interventions. Uh, this is going to be a talk about a series of studies that I did together with my collaborator for three decades or so, Marianne bakermans kahnberg professor at the Free University in Amsterdam, at University. Um, but I would like to uh, first discuss very briefly is attachment as a foundation for child development. Um, there is this famous definition in the first book by John Bowlby, Attachment, defines attachment as same child who has an attachment to strongly disposed to seek proximity to and contact with a specific figure and to do so in certain situations, notably when he's frightened, tired or ill. And this has been a definition that has been very confusing uh, in terms of 
the so-called hypothesis, the idea that there would be only one specific figure that would be an attachment person for uh, each child, and it would be the biological mother. This is a misunderstanding. Uh, certainly in later writings, where we tried very uh, eagerly and systematically to avoid that misunderstanding, it's not only the biological mother, it's also the father, grandparents, uh, all the siblings that might function in figures as long as they invest in the relationship during the first year of life in a regular Indian infant. So very important to keep in mind this specific figure can be a network of attachment figures that are following Focusing on it. Uh, it's not feeding that creates this attachment bond between the infant and uh, the, the caregiver or uh, the, the father or mother, and then clear from Harry Harlow's experiments in which these little rhesus monkeys uh, were raised by um, two mother figures, one uh, with wire without, with food and the other with cloth and without food, and in Times of distress, stress, danger, uh, attachment behavior towards the cloth mother and not towards the mother that fed this rhesus monkey. So it's not feeding, it's a separate dynamic attachment system uh, in itself, not uh, based on uh, food or interactions around food with the caregivers. It's not biological, we will see um, many examples. For example, of adoptive parents that uh, create uh, a bond in a relationship with the child and the other way around. So it's not a biological tie. And I would like to ask talk that, in fact, it's the environment. It's not the genes that make for differences between children in terms of their attachment security. So that's a preliminary remark. That's what I would like to is that attachment can be observed in various species and, and not, not only in non-human primates, certainly in years a set of ones, very uh, nice ones that are running around and this infant is seeking comfort with the mother figure. And I'm especially fond of the chimpanzees because we did a research on chimpanzee development and it was a, 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 a quasi-experimental setup that I'm going to talk about a little bit. But the first one of it in a very young chimpanzee. This is a strange situation, a lab setting in which the chimpanzee never has been. This is a chimpanzee child, an infant, around 12 months of age, comparable to an infant, a human infant. And he's separated from a human caretaker who took care of this infant during the first year of his life. Because this child, this infant, was separated from his mother uh, because the mother was period, in very bad circumstances, and would have killed this offspring how to handle it. So it had to be taken into uh, a kind of a nursery and taken care of by human caretakers. And this is what happens when this human caretaker door here, the, um, the chimpanzee is um, crying out loud caretaker again in the room. And this figure here, I don't know if you can see the, the pointer. Can you see the pointer? Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay, wonderful. This is the stranger. So the, this person has never interacted with the young chimpanzee. And um, this is what happens. <laughs> searching, searching for the disappeared person. And there is the attachment figure. And he climbs up. Cuddles in. is very tender. And within a few moments, um, he's comforted again. Secure relationship in the rest of the strange situation. And is going to uh, explore the environment uh, again. 
So this is really a very nice example. I've seen dozens, no, uh, hundreds of infants, human infants, in fact, acting in the same way, not not that gymnastics is uh, uh, climbing up to the roof, but, but surely seeking uh, uh, the, the caretaker who has been disappeared through the door, uh, crying uh, sometimes, and, and then being very cuddling in, uh, seeking proximity, keeping close contact with the caregiver, and then after a few moments, go and explore around uh, in the environment. So this is really very uh, simple type of exploration, attachment, balance in this young chimpanzee. Um, attachment is also um, this one very nice uh, fragment um, and, uh, phrase in, in Homer's Iliad, 3,000 years ago written, uh, this beautiful poem, um, and this is a picture of um, and Andromaga and Hector here, he's just came back from the battlefield um, and this is the nurse and Asinax here is the little guy uh, and he is a little bit scared because Hector uh, carries this, this, this uh, kind of helmet, helmet and it makes him a little bit anxious about uh, who is the person there. And then Hector uh, noticed that, is sensitive to the anxious expressions of his son, puts his helmet off, and then uh, there is this play and this wonderful uh, sensitive interactions between the two. That's being described by Homer. It's a network of attachment figures, the figure, uh, the nurse, uh, and Hector himself. And this is a very a nice example of attachment being over 3,000 years ago. By the way, Hector is going to go back to the battlefield to be slain by Achilles, and, and, and he will never see his son back again. It's, it's quite a dramatic uh, taking leave of his family. So this is a network of attachment relationships, uh, and it's uh, really three centers. There's other, um, other uh, proof, evidence, for the same kind of uh, attachment relationships in uh, other cultures like Egypt, etc. We're we'll going into the details, but certainly attachment is of all time. Both cultures, uh, in fact, the origin of the strange situation procedure uh, to be found in this book, Infancy in Uganda by Mary Ainsworth, who um, was experimenting with the strange situation, or a kind of strange situation, in Uganda, a uh, African country in the 50s. And she developed, in fact, the, 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 the raw um, uh, classifications, the secure, insecure, avoidant, insecure, resistant, uh, in her study, in her cultural anthropological study in Uganda, and it's actually different than this tea. It's a video clip uh, made by Mary Tru. Um, she did with collaborators a wonderful study in Dobon in Mali. And you see here a totally different type of interaction. It's a sling. So I carry it all the way. It's a beautiful picture of a child who's really part of the daily course of this uh, military. And um, there's also child care, of course, in all kinds of other cultures. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, what did I do? Uh, am I still visible or not? Uh, I think you have to minimize again this uh, screen. This window, uh, the opposite. Uh, Exit. Yeah. Yeah. And then? M minimize at the top. To the right. Yeah. Now we can and see. Do, it. do you see it again? Perfectly well. Okay, fine. So um, there's also, of course, a lot of attachment research going on in South America, and one of um, the fine pieces of that uh, is this is, is presented in this paper with Rodrigo Cardano, child care and attachment in Mapuche and non-Mapuche families. We all over the globe, we find attachment of infants to their caregivers, uh, either the mother, the father, or grandparents, or the older sibs. 
this is a very simple type of setup in uh, Mali, uh, in the Dogon by Mary uh, True. And this is just sufficient to classify an instrument. Um, Welcome to find the strange environment with play material. Put at this play material, the mother is going to sit down and is instructed not to be actively interacting. And then at some point in time, this child is going to be left alone. Uh, mother is returning again, and this child is going to show really secure attachment behavior. Yeah, it's now monitoring the mother, you'd like to know where she is, but plays again, etc. So, this is really an example of attachment. Um, but we have to take into account that this is only part of the story. Attachment is like a language. It's, it's in fact, it's inborn, but it's also environmental. And it seems like a paradox, but we should take notice of the fact that all of us, all of us, all of you in, your, in, the, in the room where you're sitting, 99% of your genome, all your genes, is the same for every human being. Only 1% is different. We have this 99% uh, uh, because uh, that's why we uh, walk on two, uh, on two legs, uh, we need oxygen to survive, we need food, we need fluids, etc. So we are very similar to one another. It's only the 1% of the genome that makes us different. We are born with the capacity to become attached, like we are born with the capacity to learn a language, but which language, uh, that's, that's really depend upon the environment. And the same is true, I think, for attachments to a large extent. We're all born with this uh, bias to become attached, but how we are going to be attached, secure, insecure, disorganized, is uh, depend upon the quality of the environment. And attachment differences are non-genetic. And that's a very contested statement, especially nowadays, the, the era of of the genome, there's a lot of genetic research going on demonstrating that all and every single ability in human beings, also psychiatric uh, disorders are genetically based, but I think uh, that's not true for attachment at least. I'd like to talk about this uh, first parenting and attachment and then go a bit uh, further into the brain, uh, how attachment is embodied in brain neural functioning. I will demonstrate that mind anyways uh, dominating uh, over matter and I would like to talk from that perspective about different susceptibility to intervention. Now, to start with the genetics of parenting and attachment, we have done quite a bit of studies on siblings and twins and the more similar the twins are, monozygotic versus dizygotic twins, the more similar should be a trait, if it, the trait would be heritable. And, and that's what we looked at in... Uh, in fact, no genetic, no heritability to be found, no difference between the monozygotic and dizygotic twins. It's all environment, either uh, C, that means common, shared environment, uh, the behavior of the parents that make two, two siblings in the same family more similar, and E, that is the unique environment, the environment that makes children in the same um, family more different, and it's also error of measurement. And you see a totally contrasting picture in temperament, temperament, irritability for example, is largely genetically based, so it's in fact uh, have a, a large component of heritability. Most of the twins are much more similar in temperamental uh, traits like irritability than these are the twins, but not so in a different security. In fact, you can also look at heritability of parenting, and this is an ongoing study in a large uh, twin study. We are studying uh, discipline, uh, discipline limit setting in three to four year olds and four to five year olds, parents who try to uh, set limits to their uh, toddlers and, and preschoolers. And we look at sensitivity. What you see here is how monozygotic twins are determining a little bit of similarity uh, of discipline, limit setting, 
uh, in Japan to launch them, and that's the 63% uh, heritability that you see in the three to four year olds. Uh, so that's, you might say, um, a heritable component in parenting. But a uh, year later, same group, uh, it's about 500 uh, twins. In the same group, you see that this has appeared, and it's all an environment. Um, the same is true for sensitivity. Sensitivity is from the start, and not heritable, but totally determined by environmental pressures, uh, common environment, um, and that makes twins in the same family more similar, and, and the unique environment. And this is work with Israel Bosley's and Saskia Elza. So the ability of parenting is, is not that uh, prominent. But nevertheless, what is now being argued very uh, vehemently, very with a lot of emphasis in Robert Plummer's book, The Blueprint, it's just out and discussed uh, quite a bit in the pockets and newspapers, uh, this quote, parents matter, but they don't make a difference. So what does it mean? Parents matter, but don't make a difference. And somebody says, parents matter, schools matter, life experiences matter, but they don't make a difference in shaping who we are. DNA is the only thing that makes a substantial systematic difference accounting for 50% of the variance in psychological traits, like, for example, IQ, school performance, but also attachment, and the rest comes down to challenges, environmental experiences that do not have long-term effects. And why does he say parents matter? Well, parents matter to feed the child, uh, to keep it protected, uh, but that doesn't make the difference between the children. That, those are fundamental precursors of any child development, but differences between children within the same family or across families are not determined by parental behavior, is his statement. And that's a, a quite uh, drastic, quite, quite radical statement. And I, I would like to show that uh, there might be some counter evidence against that statement. Uh, what he shows, uh, it's one of the pieces of evidence for that uh, very extreme. And in fact, also the nurture is nature. And uh, that's been shown very recently in a paper in Science uh, this year. Uh, you have this direct transmission of alleles. Half of the alleles of the father, half of the alleles of the mother are transferred to the child. And, and that might determine, for example, education. Attainment. There's now a polygenic score, a score of uh, thousands of uh, polymorphisms uh, that uh, predicts educational att attainment. About 10-12% of the variance of educational attainment is explained by that. And what is recently shown is that in fact also the non-transmitted the non-transmitted alleles, the other half of the genome of the father and the genome of the mother is, is uh, important for educational attainment. And why is that? Because fathers and mothers create an environment for the child, not uh, through a transmission of genes, but by having a certain style of uh, child rearing, of book reading, or it's the genetic nurturing pathway, and that is explained about one third of the total variance that is explained by the um, by the direct transmission. But if you uh, total, if you sum both influences, the indirect and the direct influences of the genes of the father and the mother and the child's education attainment, it's only explaining about 15%, and it remains 85% to be explained. And I think most of the explanation will be found in the environment, in gene by environment interaction or in environmental pressures like parenting style. Okay, so. One of the most important counter-employment statements is that if we can dramatically change child development, for example, the development of attachments, by changing the rearing environment, can we then still argue that parenting doesn't matter? And, and is that true if, if that's the case when we can control for genetic transmission of parenting, of parental genes? Uh, I think important central studies was 
stuff that we did in, in the aid ministries and junkies, a period and, uh, and responsive care. Uh, that, that was the study uh, from which this uh, videotape uh, was taken in the chimpanzee. Uh, it was 29 young chimpanzees in standard care, only being fed, medical cared for, mostly period, and responsive care. An enhanced caretaking by four hours of extra care by a, a, a unique, exclusive human caretaker. And that's a lot of intensive play with uh, these infant chimpanzees. And what it, um, what it had kind of an effect on the Baileys, for example, cognitive development was that it was promoting cognitive development quite significantly. And more importantly for us, strange situation behavior became much more secure in this setting of, of course, no genetic transmission between the human caretaker and the infant chimpanzee is a different type of interaction. Uh, the same setting, strange situation, stranger, uh, the caretaker comes in. But this is a caretaker from the standard care setting. Uh, so not then reached in terms of interaction setting. The caretaker is entering, and now you see hesitant, really distressed behavior, doesn't know what to do, whether it should get close or not. It's kind of a disorganized behavior, certainly very insecure compared to the first clip that we saw of this other chimpanzee infant. infant will not explore the environment uh, in the three minutes it's coming after this clip, so it's really insecure in standard care, not being taken care of in a sensitive and responsive way. No genetic transmission, totally environmental pressures on, on this uh, infant to become insecure instead of secure. So the environment is very important. I would found across uh, the almost three quarters of the sample in the standard care was disorganized at times and only 40 percent half of it uh, was disorganized in the responsive care setting so it's really making an important significant difference difference in environment <laughs> necessary conditions for healthy development. The social environment in which a human child is reared deviates from the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, which is probably father, mother, siblings. The social environment comprising grandparents and a limited number of other known families. This is an attachment network, not monotropy. The greater will be the risk of his developing maladaptive patterns of social behavior. So the more that deviates from this uh, attachment network, the more the chance of maladaptation. And that's what we see in our work in orphanages. And this is a videotape taken in an orphanage in India. And this is what you see in an overcrowded uh, in room. Many, many children taken care of by overwhelmed, overburdened uh, caretakers. So you might have noticed two important issues here. First, this self-suiting behavior, which you see, uh, for example, a lot in children with, within the autism spectrum. Uh, certainly, this has been called by uh, Michael Rutter, a child psychiatrist, uh, uh, pseudo-autism. Um, and I think he was right. This is very distressed behavior, sound suiting behavior with this rhythmic uh, back and forth and this holding on to this cloth. And that's the second issue that you might notice. This is the taking care of by this caretaker, just picking away, just getting away this cloth that was one of the few uh, cuddly um, objects that uh, made the distress a little bit less. 
So this is very insensitive intervention in this child's uh, behavior. And that's, I think, more the rule than the exception in this type of overcrowded uh, orphanages. Without parents, and there's no transmission, you see a lot of insecurity uh, emerging. An interaction that uh, we found in a set of uh, Indian in, in orphanages at the spot with spot of, uh, observations. Uh, you see here uh, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of non interactions, uh, eighty percent, and very few interactions with the caretakers and also with other children. Very few uh, interaction. The same is true uh, activities in a more broader sense of the child. Mostly interaction or non meaningful activities. Uh, a lot of routines and sleeping and uh, about 15% only of meaningful activities. So in the orphanage itself, there's very little stimulation, very little uh, possibility of becoming attached. Same we can see here, uh, caregiver to target child, very little induced, zero, and the same is true for vocalizations of the child to the adult very little interaction going on with what should be an attachment figure, with what is not becoming a very secure base for this child to explore the see And in terms of delays, developmental delays, in all kinds of respects, uh, this is the uh, limit uh, of two standard deviations below uh, zero, and that's the average um, weight for age, uh, height for age, head circumference for age, and IQ, 100, and you go down two standard deviations into the area of standard weight for age stage, and, and really a, a much smaller head circumference compared to peers reared in a biological family. And in terms of IQ, uh, this is a difference average of uh, 2 by 15, two standard deviations, this is 33030 IQ points, this is from 100 to, this is on the border of mental retardation. And that's not the starting point, that's where these infants find themselves around 1, 2 or 3 years of age, having been raised in an orphanage. Happens another little clip. It's horrible to see. This is really a uh, golden uh, in, in, in vivo and in, 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 really in this orphanage uh, peers who are maltreating each other. We found in our uh, maltreatment study in uh, residential care settings in Holland uh, in adolescent uh, groups and to peer maltreatment and abuse, also a lot of abuse towards the caregivers in the residential setting. Uh, but this is at a very young age in which the children are very vulnerable and, and you can imagine what happens. And not monitored by a, a caregiver, an adult person, this is what children are able to do to each other and it's horrible to see. Uh, so. I know there is quite a bit of research going on uh, in various um, orphans or institutional settings and it seems that the quality of the institutional care environment in South America and different countries is a little bit better than what we can show here and what we found in Ukraine uh, and in, in Greece where we did our studies. Um, and this other work going on, has been going on in Eastern Europe, also in China. And this, um, this might be different in South America, but surely there uh, is potentially very bad environment for children. This is a, a, a unique child, an infant, four and a half months of age, Bangladesh, uh, quite a bit of time ago. Uh, Shira, she's called, seven months. She's uh, this, so not bigger uh, girl, and at 11 months it's really kind of a Dutch 
uh, really uh, thick uh, cheeks uh, when uh, a child who was, uh, in fact, adopted in a Dutch family. And he maybe some months after adoption, uh, throughout the months in the first year of life, for weight, for age, and how to age. It's, just, it's a, an, an, an incredible increase uh, going back into the direction of an average growth. Still, of course, delayed at around uh, 11 months, but sure, surely heading for total recovery. And this is... Uh, it's the daughter of Arik, adoption professor, fed her child and grandchild. It's a beautiful family. And this is uh, how it might end if uh, she's lucky enough to get adopted in a uh, caring family environment. And that's what we see in the material children as well. Um, here's a weight for, I, uh, for, uh, for age. Go in the first 12 months when these children in Greece, uh, Meteor, uh, Athens, study that we did with Florea, uh, um, like a water who's involved as well, and Judy Dunn. Uh, so it's going down, wait for age in the first uh, year uh, before adopt, being adopted compared to a group of children uh, raised in a, uh, in a regular family setting. But when they have been adopted within Greece, within a family, and uh, took care of them very uh, great way, then you see that this group of children, first very deprived, is going to go up in weight for age, up until a point in which, in fact, you can say there's no difference anymore with the uh, peers that are more lucky from, from birth onwards. So, two lessons. Um, an institutional setting can be very detrimental to child development in terms of very basic parameters of growth and IQ, cognition, but also attachments, as we will see later, um, which demonstrates how children, individual differences of children uh, are going to emerge if environments are drastically changing. And second, the recovery, the resilience of children is enormous. If they transit from a very bad environment to a much better environment, then they are able to uh, cover, to cover the delay very quickly, to catch up very quickly into the direction of uh, uh, almost the same developmental level of, as their peers that were more lucky. So at some points, there will be differences still uh, in the long run for a small minority of these children, but most of them will uh, develop quite, uh, quite nicely. So that demonstration, without any genetics involved, how important the environment is for child development. So we are in uh, is my uh, and I know uh, some of you are new because of your care settings in South America, but outside of this environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, as is with John Bowie, the regimented, the regimented nature, high child to caregiver ratio, multiple shifts, we found really often 14 different caregivers in the first three years for the single child. And it's impossible to imagine an attachment bond to be created with caretakers. Frequent change that makes children become uh, delayed, very delayed in all kinds of respects and emotionally disturbed. Matter, but it don't make a difference. I would question that statement, and that's because I feel that there's large changes through change of the real environment that we saw in the chimpanzee example, but also in the example of in the example of adoption of institutional uh, institutionalized children. Uh, and, and I don't go into any details, but uh, one of the big difficulties or issues in behavioral genetics is that the, the size of uh, heritability is dependent upon differences, the size of the differences in the environment. The smaller the difference in the environment, the more homogeneous the environment, the larger the heritability. And most of the heritability studies are being done in so-called weird societies, societies that are industrialized, very homogeneous in terms of the environment, and that's why in many cases you find a very large factor 
but if you would do research in more heterogeneous groups across the world, across the globe, you would certainly find smaller heterogeneity, larger influence of the environment. So that's the first part. Um, second part is into uh, more the direction of neural activation of how attachment is embedded in the brain. And we use um, as a paradigm for doing that kind of studies, um, we use crying. Um, crying, smiling and babbling are being presented uh, not only by John Bowlby, but already by Charles Garfty uh, years ago. I was so happy to be able to visit sites in the most southern part of Chile with uh, Rodrigo um, to uh, visit uh, the place Charles Darwin was uh, uh, searching for a new school, was learning with his boat of Beagle and, and explore the environment. Um, Charles Darwin was a great inspiration for John Bowlby. And John Bowlby considered crying, smiling, and babbling like Charles Darwin as social signals the predictable outcome of increased proximity to mother or other parents to the child. And this is from the book by Charles Allen, Expression of Emotions in Humans. And so on the pictures, crying children here, uh, of the children. He was a very acute, astute uh, observer of his own children and, and was a very sensitive person to write about the development of his own children. Crying, um, just very quickly, um, is being considered something that you can observe in other species, as, at least uh, in terms of basal cry, which might serve the truncation uh, because of the eyes that are drying out if you don't have cries, tears in cochleas, for example. Um, this this story that elephants would cry, I don't know, it's uh, apocryphal or it's real. Uh, there's certainly a re kind of a reflex cry in, in species, a uh, reflex cry that you also know in terms of uh, being triggered by onions. And maybe there's arguing about, but uh, maybe the emotional cry is unique to the human species. And you see here quite a bit of crying babies. And I don't know how many of you did have, do have uh, experience with babies, but they certainly are able to cry a lot. And um, what is uh, beautiful about babies is the eyes. The eyes are mostly very large compared to uh, the other parts of the, the face. That's the facial attractiveness of, of see here they crying in crying, they all close their eyes. So they make themselves even more ugly and trying to really attract attention of the environment. And what we did in one of the studies with uh, the school brain um, responses to certain uh, sounds and, and, and visual stimuli was showing um, adults and faces, similar faces, totally exactly the same faces, but with one little difference, and that's computerized. Here you see this, this no tear drops, but uh, the face through a software program. And the question is, does it make a difference? Uh, if you look at it, just look at it, and what makes the most impact in the the face with or without a tear. And second question, uh, are children with or without this cry face tears or without tears, are these more, more affecting adult onlookers than adult faces do? That's, uh, that were the two major questions that we asked ourselves in one of our studies with Madeleine Wien, a PhD student. And here is the outcome. What you see is a lot more activation in different parts of the brain uh, when you compare infant tearful faces with infant sad faces without tears compared to adult tearful faces without and adult faces without tears. Uh, a lot less sickness, a lot less activation, more activity. And so it seems that emotionally, uh, children, whether or not they carry this tear, uh, still are creating a lot more 
activity in the brain, and but uh, if you add a tear to this infant phase, infant phase, you get even more activation, more activation. So it's certainly accumulating our uh, responses to an infant if it's adding this tear for. Now, well, this was looking at phase as phases, and what we also have been doing is having um, adult caregivers and parents, but also students, having listening them to cry sounds, and this is what it sounds like. So this is uh, the cry sound of a girl, of an infant of two days old. This is a real cry sound, and what we did was uh, elevate a pitch um, through a computer. Oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, we created a control sound. You have to have a control sound to make a difference uh, in, the, in the scanner. In the So this is the same acoustic signal, this is the same sound that you heard before, this is a cry sound, but it's scrambled, it's randomly um, uh, moved around so that you don't recognize it really as a cry sound. And you need that to keep it under control the acoustic processing uh, of uh, the sound and to only focus on the emotional meaning of, of cry sounds in, in a scanner. Uh, compare uh, Miller and these are the twins, separate them in two different sets and uh, take the adult attachment interview and, and see how uh, the security or insecurity of their view, their perspective on, on their childhood uh, attachment experiences, how that would influence, affect the processing of the, uh, of the crime sounds. And the adults have to tell uh, most of them what the content and the kind is of this interview. It's developed by Mary Main and Cassie and other senior structures. General, it asks for general descriptions of childhood attachment relationships, whether the mother was very lovingly or rejecting the father. And, and then, most importantly, ask for concrete evidence from attachment related experience. Evaluate effects on current personality and also for losses and maltreatment experiences. Uh, coherence is essential. It's the coherence between the general descriptors and the concrete evidence that's called of classification and scales that can be uh, the adult attachment interview of about one hour, insecure, dismissing, preoccupied, and unresolved. And these are a few examples. Um, this is a secure fragment from um, an interview with a uh, person who says, well, my father was not that physical. It's something that I realized later on, that I might have missed that. Uh, maybe it's a bit strongly put, because I remember some instances that we cuddled together in front of the TV, but my father did not give a lot of physical affection. So this is really not closing yourself down for negative experiences. Uh, so that's not idealizing, but on the other hand, it's also not being immersed in the negative aspect. It, it, it's, it's a person who sees also the positive part of the story. It's a nicely balanced, uh, secure fact. Another one. The person says, well, my mother was very lovingly. It was a general thing. Uh, ask for concrete evidence. I, I can't think of more example. You just know that she loved you. Wow, that's difficult. You, I could always get what I wanted. So, the lack of recall, uh, getting back to um, a materialistic kind of argumentation, idealization. Um, so, this is a dismissing type of attachment. Dissatisfied called the, this person, this individual, the mother, was always dissatisfied. She was never dissatisfied with her looks, always complaining about her weight, this and that, about washing, washing cleaning, all herself, victimizing, always being at the time, you know. You go and wash your own stuff. Okay, I'm not your slave. So this is really being involved in the past uh, still, um, being angry. 
um, is trying to elicit the interviewer. This is typically a fragment from a preoccupied interview, insecure preoccupied. Um, and this is um, a series of questions in, uh, the, in the interview about loss and maltreatment. It's all about lapses in the monitoring of reasoning, not about uh, the concrete event of loss, but it's the way in which you talk about the loss or the traumatic experience that's important uh, in this adult attachment interview. And that's also the brilliance of it. It's a mode of speech, not a content. And years ago, and this mother says, well, he was so lonely, and then he died. And it was an open casket, you know, flowers, his shiny watch. I had this, his picture on the wall, you know, so he just knows I'm still there for him. So this is kind of a disbelief, uh, belief in his continuing presence. It's a change from uh, past tense into present tense. It's intrusion. So this is quite similar to um, as, as, to some, some symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And it's uh, indeed quite highly correlated with unresolved See in uh, the uh, scan, in the imaging studies that we have been doing, is that insecure attachment representations certainly are affecting or making a difference for neural processing of infant crying. And here you see one of the results. Infant um, crying creates more uh, amygdala activation in the respondents who have been shown to be insecurely attached, insecure view of their past attachment experiences. And the amygdala has been found in many, many studies to be a central region in the brain related to anxiety, and way um, elevated levels of anxiety, aversive feelings, arousal. So it means that insecure attached um, representations are associated with um, more activation in a brain center which is related to aversion, arousal. And that's uh, true for, uh, that's true for um, all the insecure attachment um, types, classifications. For, uh, behavior. Uh, they feel more irritated listening to attachment uh, to uh, choir sounds and uh, they uh, show more excessive hand grip force when they are um, um, asked to uh, use a hand grip and go from full strength to half strength. So they also have behavioral uh, consequences or they show behavioral consequences of this insecure attachment representation. So Crying triggers in sense of parenting and insecure attachment, uh, strong reactions to crying. It's very important uh, from the perspective of attachment is that mind is indeed uh, dominating uh, above matter. Because if you label the same uh, sound, uh, whether it comes from a, a, an infant that is bored or uh, whether it's sick, so same acoustic signal, but the label is it comes from a sick child or it comes from a bored child. Uh, and then you see a lot of differences in neural processing in the brain, especially in the inferior frontal gyrus and in the left insula. You see a much more um, diverse response uh, when it comes from sick to versus uh, bored. And uh, under the influence of oxytocin, by the way, a very important hormone related to attachment processing of attachment signals of the child. And these inferior for the gyrus and left insula are uh, related to parental sensitivity. So it seems like um, the labeling is very important to make um, parents more aware of the needs of the child to uh, interact and to be suited. So it's not the child's behavior in itself, but the projection, the making sense of the child's behavior by the parent that is critical for no processing and parental responses. And that's the core effect of sensitivity, of attachment theory. Sensitivity is the, is the capability to read and label the child's attachment signals correctly. So we might choose to use oxytocin to elevate the level of sensitivity or video feedback. I would choose any time for video feedback intervention because oxytocin uh, will not have 
that uh, uh, per pervasive persistent effects on um, parental sensitivity, and we don't know anything about side effects of oxytocin. It has been used now in children with autism, but I think prematurely so. Video feedback, on the other, shown to be very effective in many uh, randomized controlled trials. We developed it uh, over the last 25 years as just uh, being conducted um, a workshop in um, in this uh, in this um, um, method of intervening supporting parents uh, in a pre conference workshop. Jenny Otis was conducting it, and it's uh, based upon uh, two ideas. It is based upon Bobby Ainsworth, um, sensitivity central, but also uh, on Patterson's social learning theory. It is making central the idea of sensitive interactions around discipline issues. And this is what we find across many randomized control trials in many different groups. Effectiveness quite a bit of a half a standard deviations in terms of parental sensitivity being elevated. You see there's in poverty samples, in samples in other cultures, in uh, children with autism, families with children with autism, etc. As positive parenting outcomes, but also positive outcomes, fewer behavioral problems uh, in the long run as well, increasing child responsiveness and reduction in daily cortisol, greater autonomy. Um, and that's important because parental sensitivity indeed um, is uh, predicting of child brain structure. And that's an important lesson to learn. We did this study in the context of Generation R, observing parental sensitivity in fathers and mothers in the first three, four years of life. And that uh, brain around eight, nine years. And what we found was brain structure changed pre-central, pro-central, called the middle front of uh, was, for example, uh, predicted um, a thicker um, cluster uh, predicted by higher sensitivity in the first three to four years. And these are centers of the brain that might be very important for the mirroring system, uh, the mirror neuron system, and uh, might be very important for the development of empathic concern in the children. So, Sensitivity has its consequences in the brains, in the neural structure of the child uh, at a later stage of time. But now, this intervention uh, video feedback doesn't work always the same way for everyone. And what we are, have been looking for in the last 10, 15 years is for whom would this intervention work best? Uh, and that's structurality theory developed together with uh, J um, um, Jay Balski and Tom Boyce um, and, and others. And it's the idea that some children are more affected for better and for worse by the real environment. They are just more open, more susceptible to any change in the environment for better and for worse. And you can predict which children are and which parents are more open to the environment on the basis of their temperament, temperamental reactivity, Biological sensitivity to context, more stress vulnerability, and genetic makeup. And we did a lot of studies on genetics of different susceptibility. I'm going to shortcut that, I'm not going to go into any detail, but we are now able to predict uh, who is going to be most open to intervention effects and who is uh, less open to intervention effects. The metaphors, the orchids, and the Bambi lions. I want to show. Uh, one little result, um, now middle, it's based upon uh, 22 randomized control trials and various different um, samples, very different um, 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 research centers, more than 3,000 participants. And what we found was meta-analytically, uh, putting together all the evidence from these 22 studies, is a great difference, susceptible variants, genetic variants, 33, that's a very big effect of the interventions for the better, uh, versus almost no effect in the comparisons, in the non-carriers of this susceptible variance. And you have to take, uh, have to keep in mind that the susceptible variance, like for example dopamine before receptor 7 repeat, 
uh, has been considered for a long time as a risk factor, for example, a risk factor for becoming drug addicted or alcohol abusing. Uh, but it seems that there's another side to this story, namely a positive, a bright side, that these same children, carriers of these risky genes or risky temperaments, are also more open to a, a, a better environment, to positive parenting, to uh, the results of interventions like incredible news and like video feedback, positive parenting. Let us think in importance uh, if we do interventions and we all do interventions to support parents and teachers and children, and then we have to take into account that not everyone is the same way susceptible to the effects. And that's what different susceptibility predicts. There are more susceptible parents and children and less susceptible to, uh, parents and children. And we should not be disappointed with average effect sizes that are relatively modest because the effects are in the susceptible subgroups. So this is, I uh, want to end with this one. So cycle of insensitive parenting. Uh, very important to realize that on different levels you might intervene. Psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy might be tried out in some cases, but especially interactive feedback is very important to change the negative projections of parents and teachers on the child's capabilities and child's signals, and so make their more processing and behavior more optimal uh, in terms of sensitivity and sensitive discipline. But we have to take into account the concept of different susceptibility because that limits our effectiveness, at least in those children and families who are less susceptible to our intervention efforts. So this is all I would like to uh, thank Femi Hiffer, Maya Bakermanskander, and all our PhD and postdoc, and other colleagues, and thank you for your patience.